What's up, yo? Welcome to the Young Legends Podcast, where we teach you the cheat codes to the game of life. I'm your host, Caption, aka Caption Red, and I hope you're doing well wherever you are. I'm really excited to bring you this episode, which is my conversation with filmmaker Michael Addis. Michael Addis is an accomplished writer, producer, and director working in the film and TV industry. He was the original showrunner and director for Impractical Jokers. He has directed three Comedy Central stand-up specials and has produced and directed two feature films, Poor White Trash and the documentary Heckler, as well as working on countless film projects throughout his career. Michael, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm super excited to interview you today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I'm in beautiful Los Angeles, California, and uh, it's a little hot right now, but it's it's nice. Yeah, L.A., that weather is, uh, man, it's a dream of. Uh, what, now, what is hot for <laughs> uh, your standards right now? Because we're, <laughs> you know, we're at the end of March right now. So I know. Well, it's funny. It's You know, it's funny you say that because, like, this is sort of a, a a blank spot in my knowledge, being able to identify Fahrenheit. Like I I could tell you right now, I'm guessing it's because I because I never have to. Like in LA, it's like it's always 72. So mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you if it's 73 or 74 or 78. I could. It's just it's a little hot. But I but we in California we just don't ever pay attention to that stuff. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't. It's just a little hot. Anyway, that's enough about the weather. Good God. What could be more boring? People are tuning out already. No worries. No, 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 no. Well, they they shouldn't tune out because you you might be the most interesting man in the world. Um, (laughs) Well, the the most interesting man in the world is is Jewish, and so am I. So we have that in common. Nice, nice, nice. Awesome. Well, I mean, I've read through all of your stuff um, as far as your website and you Mm -hmm. know all the cool things that you've worked on. Uh, You've pretty much done everything besides whole political office. So um, good job on that, by the way. <laughs> I I did that. help people get uh, hold political office, but I didn't. Not not. It's not for me. Yeah, <laughs> but, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, there's a person in the newspaper today. Not newspaper. When I'm a hundred years old, there's a person <laughs> in the news today who um, who I did a documentary with him, and it resulted in him getting a very powerful position in the Trump administration. Don't oh. I don't put that in my resume usually, but yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it sounds good. Very cool. Well, you know, you've you've done so many things in film. You've done so many things. Just oh man, what a resume! But I, I wanted to kick off the podcast with one particular thing, one mm-hmm. particular story mm-hmm. of uh, your int- most interesting life. So, uh, would you like to share an interesting story with us? Um, you know what? You asked me about it, about that, and I didn't have a great story right now. I, uh, but I do have a, a a bit of something I've been thinking about, which is the a lesson I learned early on was that the notes you get notes are what's called like just when when you when you make create something and people criticize it or have problems with it or they want things fixed. Those are called notes, and so. The notes I get from executives, uh, TV executives, because I work a lot in TV, is they'll say, this is what's wrong, and then this is how to fix it. And more often than not, they, they're get, they get it right as to what's wrong with the, with the project, but, but their fixes are usually off, right? And I find mm-hmm. that to be prevalent in society. Like, right now, we're, we're spotting the problems we're spotting the racism, the problems with transgender, the problems with uh, Asian hate and all that, and every all, all, all these issues. But then the more you hear people discuss the solutions, the solutions are so often all, not, not wouldn't work. And so I find that as I talk to people, that seems to come up again and again, is this certainty of the solution when if we were being honest, we would say, well, here we have the problem, but we don't know what the the solution is. So I I hope that people uh, sit with that and question, do we really have the solutions or do we just have like the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you. And oftentimes what seems like a solution 
would just create more problems. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. just the nature of life. It's like it's oftentimes our solutions do create more problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you I don't even know where to start this interview because you've done so much and um, I, I have a million questions I want to ask you, but uh, I'm only going to ask you about 100,000. So um, I guess let's start with the beginning. And actually, I just I want to ask you about your um, film career that started in a, I guess, um, in a, um, Costco. In a place, <laughs> in a, yeah, in a place most people wouldn't expect, right? Exactly. Um, well, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me, I'll try to do the, the short version. Um, when I was about 13 years old, I was very lucky. I, when I was 13, I knew what I wanted to do and almost everything I was interested in kind of created a funnel to what I eventually would do. You know, I was interested in writing. I was interested in reading. I was interested in acting. I was interested in photography. Everything kind of led to this. Right. And so I didn't have that moment of what am I going to do? I mean, I, I wanted at one point to be a reporter and that I didn't, but that was still kind of what I do because I, I do like to work in documentaries. So I always knew it and I had to take a, I, I joined a band as a drummer and I wasn't even musical, but they taught me drums and that's a long story. But anyway, so I was going to film school in San Diego and working at what's used to be Costco. Now it was called Price Club and then it merged to Costco and now it's just Costco. Um, so I was working there and my boss called me in one day and said, oh, we're going to have to fire you because you're, it's an interesting situation. You're, you're, you're getting the most complaints of any cashier at Price Club, but also getting the most compliments. So we just don't know what to do with you. And I said, well, I do. I know what to do with me. I should make films for you guys. And they said, well, we don't make films and we don't advertise, so that won't work. And I said, well, it could because you get a lot of back injuries and you guys are, are employees get a lot of back injuries and you guys are um, self-insured. So if you give me 10%, I think I asked for 10% of one back injury, I'll make a video that will teach people how not to get back injuries and they won't, they will save you a lot of money. So they were convinced that that would work. And I kind of just pulled it on my ass because it was I was desperate and didn't want to get fired. So I started making uh, I made a film for them. And then a few months later, they kind of thought, oh, well, maybe we could do another one. And then I started doing that regularly. And that became my job is doing educational films for Price Club or Costco. And I was going to film school and trying to get into the film department, which was impacted. I couldn't get in. Meanwhile, I was actually a professional filmmaker. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I was ma making money, making films. And I would, I would try things out and I would say, oh, I'd like to try shooting in film or I'd like to try this special effect or something. And I would just do it because I had a regular uh, – I mean nowadays you could just do it on YouTube. But then – in order to make films, I had to have to get some funding and then educational films, they would just, we would just keep on making them anyway. So that became my job. And so I kind of got, you know, right out, right in film school. I was already employed as a filmmaker. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I, I love that story. I love that you had the chutzpah to approach the president of the company. Um, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, hey, that was, like, wow. that was a tough day. Cause I was like, I saw him in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the store. And I was like, oh, I got to talk to him. I got to talk to him. And I just went right up to him and I said, Hey Robert, uh, did you see Robert? His name is Robert price. It's price club. And believe it or not, his last name is price. And so I said, did you see them? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's good. I go, I'd really like to make more. And I was just, I was just so desperate to get out of being a cashier. Even I, I just, it's funny. Cause like I was in a store the other day and they had the self-serve lines and my girlfriend was like, uh, let's go through the self-serve lines. I'm like, no, 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 I'm retired. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a cashier anymore. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I, it still kind of haunts me, but I was a yeah. cashier for, for yeah. a few years. <laughs> yeah. I got that, uh, Costco PTSD. I see it. <laughs> it is a little bit of a, a PTSD. I can't, I can't look at a cashier, a, a cash register again. <laughs> That's great. Well, you've come a very far way from, uh, making uh, back injury videos for Costco. You were the original, uh, I guess, director and showrunner 
for Impractical Jokers, yeah. which, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a That's small little okay. show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so first off, uh, I guess, how did you get into that gig right there? Oh, that was uh, that was just a straight up. My agent called one day and said they're looking for showrunner directors for the show. Call it was a call at the time. It was called Mission Uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and he sent me the tape of, of of the guys, and I said, "Oh, these guys are really good." They had done stuff that was not great. Like it was, their narrative stuff was just not that great. But their their this idea was amazing, mm -hmm. and. They were amazing. So it's like it was kind of they had been in some hit and miss stuff, but I knew that they had a lot of potential. And I remember the interview, they, the, the final question of the interview was, are you an asshole? Mm. And I said, mm, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I said, I guess an asshole would say definitely not an asshole, <laughs> but I don't know if I, but I, I may be an asshole. I, I don't I honestly I, I don't know how to answer because I if I was an oh, asshole, I, maybe I wouldn't know it. And, you know, there's that. So anyway, it was a, <laughs> a complicated answer that ended up getting me the job. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of them don't actually. Like, most I'm a assholes. Are, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because I did one time have through my health insurance, I had like free therapy and I was like, oh, I'll take free therapy. And so I went in and he said, what would you like to talk about? I go, well, I want to. I, I, this is well before that question was even asked. I said, I'd like to know if I'm an asshole. Like, like, mm. can you tell me? And he goes, that's really not how therapy works. And I said, well, what, what would be more important than knowing if you're an asshole or not? And he said, well, most people that are assholes just want to confirm their lives and they don't want to change oh, to being yeah. a non-asshole. And so I was like, all right, well, I want to know if I'm an asshole. <laughs> and so right. it, we determined I wasn't. Yeah. And I guess just asking if you are it shows the empathy that yeah. means that you're not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I have been, I've done asshole things. I've, I've probably said things. I, de in, you know, in my, after years and years in the business, I realized that you have to be very, very careful with creative people. And mm -hmm. I mean, I did a documentary about this, but oh yes, heckler. But but you really do have to be very. They see you as kind of a father figure or a or or, or mother or just some paternal figure that you know you can't destroy their hearts. You know, if they're creative and they're tr and you're trying to get the best out of them, you have to be a, a pretty nice person and not berate them. Back in the day, they used to people used to just scream at actors, and now it's like that rarely happens. Oh yeah, that's terrible. Goodness yeah, gracious, and uh, doesn't that, work. That, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. And I also would think to myself, like, why would you want to scream at an actor? That's not going to get them to do what they're do their best acting. What? <laughs> well, wait. You so <laughs> you asked the question, why would you want to scream at an actor? Uh, I could give you a bunch of reasons. <laughs> okay. they're, they're, I I wouldn't do it. But they can, it can be a frustrating experience. I'm like you're trying to create sure. something. And if an actor doesn't hasn't learned their lines or isn't oh, sure. or is refusing to do something that is sort of essential to the character or something. Mm -hmm. Like I just was I'm not gonna say he's an asshole, but but I read a story about David Fincher was dealing with uh Ben Affleck, and Ben Affleck wouldn't wear a certain hat. Because it was like a, it was a Jets hat or something like that, and it was it was a, a team that he didn't like, and he's a Boston Red Sox fan, and he right. wouldn't wear the New York hat. And I was like, ah, oh, that would be so frustrating. It's like your it's not you, it's your character. You right, yeah, the, yeah, the character sure. wears the hat. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah, that would that would make me a little crazy. And yeah, I, okay. you know, so so actors can be a little. I mean, look, they can be a little crazy making. Sure. So no, you can't no, I, yell at them, but. There's times when, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Now, now that you put it into context, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. totally. I'm sure Ben Affleck's a nice guy, but that sounded like something that would have triggered me to go, come on, dude, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, uh, that's a funny story. Now, I, I, I want to backtrack and, and talk a little bit about the hidden camera world. And I mean, I find I love Impractical Jokers, and sure. um, I think you know, I I I just love hidden camera videos. I just watch them and I uh, cry happy tears. 
I, I have by the way, I do too. Uh, like I, I, I really love it. Like it's, it, it is a lot of fun. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So I have a feeling that some of my listeners would like to get into this profession. What advice would you have for a young person who would want to become a, uh, I guess, a professional kid and hammer, cre- uh, kid and hidden camera creator? Um, yeah. What advice would you have for them? Okay. Here's my key piece of advice. The idea of setting up hidden cameras is it's, it's the technical end you can learn in an afternoon. It's the philosophy of, of what makes a good bit. And I find, and there's no rules, but I find that if you're lampooning people's desire to help, or if you're, if you're not, if you're not making a comment about something that you think is funny or I kind of like, like Tom Green taught me, like if you if you pretend that you got shot and people are helping you, that's not mm-hmm. funny no. because it's it's just you're not you're not lampoon you're not making a good a joke about anything funny. It's it's just people want to help somebody who's hurt. That's not that funny. But if you are poking at people's idiosyncrasies, their self importance, mm-hmm. or or their racism, as Sasha Baron Cohen does, or, or mm-hmm. anti semitism. That's funny. I mean, I think it's funny. And so it's like you really have to look at the bit and say, what are we getting our humor from? And to me, that's that it all starts with that. And uh, if you study even Eric Andre is amazing, just a brilliant uh, artist and Sasha Baron Cohen, if you just study those two guys, you'll be looking at some pretty cutting edge comedy and socio sociological uh commentary that i think works in the genre yeah absolutely yeah i'm sasha baron cohen is i mean he is he is something else he's quite good at what he does and wow Uh uh-huh yeah yeah and there's and there's times when you know impractical jokers which you know obviously is as big or bigger than those guys i mean i don't know if i would say that but they're 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 pretty popular their their work is their work is can be really impressive. I I I I I just I don't want to leave them out because I've I know sure. them, but but that you know the those three groups are are pretty much everything you need to know about hidden camera in my mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, speaking of successful people in show business, you've worked with a lot of people. Yes, um, and you obviously have seen some people who did really well and you've seen some people who had the potential, but they didn't. So what's a common trait that you see amongst people in show business that helps them to become successful? Work ethic. Mm. I mean, I would put that above talent. Sure. I, I just, I just don't, I, it's when I was working on heckler with Jamie Kennedy, who's a f- close friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, he always worked so hard that I had to, I had to work a little harder just to keep up. And a lot of times I would like, I'd go to bed thinking, you know, if I don't work harder than Jamie, I'm going to be disappointed in myself. Like I don't, like I want to be the hardest working guy on set Mm -hmm. and there'd be, there'd be, we'd be working, we'd be working on like going on like 16 hours and he goes, he'd be saying like, Hey, we got a flight in a few hours. And my thought was, yes, take a nap before the flight or something. He's like, yeah, let's just do some more stuff. So it was basically like, just go, go, go. If, if you could catch two hours of sleep, well, why, why bother? <laughs> that was his, yeah. and I'm not, and I don't think it's healthy necessarily, but it was, but it got him where he, where he, what, where he, you know, very, very high up because of his work ethic. And so I would, I would never, you know, I always say that like when I'm working with somebody, it's like either they have to have a lot of talent or a big work, work ethic or ideally both. But if I had to pick one, I would, I'd probably pick work ethic because that you could sort of develop the talent. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I love Jamie's work, by the way, Mm -hmm. Um, at watching heckler was painful for me. Really was. It was, they were just I'm so glad. cruel to him. And I was just like, really? <laughs> I know. Like you're, you're a guy, like literally the, one of the guys was a bus boy and he was just trashing Jamie. I was like, you're a bus boy, dude. And <laughs> like, no offense, you know, but 
you don't create stuff and you're sitting here. Uh, I don't know. I just, yeah, it, well, uh, everybody's got an opinion and it's, and it's so crazy. Cause I think the movie to me was like giving a child two packs of cigarettes and saying, you want to smoke here, smoke all t- <laughs> to smoke all these cigarettes. It's like, it, it makes you realize that opinions and v- criticism, it's like having opinions, having critical opinions. Sometimes you could just take a break. You don't need to have an opinion about everything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, 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 and to me, like wa- watching the movie, hopefully you start to see by the end of it, it's like, maybe sometimes I could just shut up, you know, because ja- Jamie, one thing about being famous is that people feel the need to come up to you and say nice things, but also say what they didn't like. So it's like, mm-hmm. for some reason, they think that's a more honest approach is to say, Hey, I really like Mel was Mel Boos must want but I really didn't like some of the mask. And then it's like, now he's thinking about some of the mask and it's just not that fun to hear about something that didn't work, even though naturally you're going to do things in your, in your life that don't work. I, and I don't even know this. I mean, we made this years ago. I don't even know if I still feel that way, but I do feel like that the need for opinions about everything is probably overrated. Yeah, absolutely. And in that, um, in that same, I, I, I have guess. an opinion about opinions. I, I get it. That, that there's <laughs> no, no, that's not where I was going. With yeah, that. okay. <laughs> but, that's funny. Yeah. Um, but you know, everybody is a critic, right? And yes. this is a massive problem that we have in our society. So, what advice do you have for creators and also people in general? about dealing with the critics and dealing with the haters because they're everywhere. You poke your head up out of your room and <laughs> you're going to get criticized and someone's going to say something. So what advice do you have? Cause... I, I, well, okay, because obviously I've, I've thought about this a lot, so I, I, it's easy to, to, to it's fr- front in mind right now. Here's the thing. If you have a dream and you want to, to be like a singer or something, and somebody gives you a piece, any piece of advice that helps you or gets you to move forward and gets you to work a little harder or to be a little bit better, great. If they tell you something that's a little painful, but it pushes you to be better, great. Uh, if you take that advice or take that criticism and then it stops you, well, that's on you. You, you got to figure a way to make sure that it doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. And so you could get all the input you want, but it is, it can be tough, but your job is just to keep on going and just keep on getting better. And I was just, actually, I was just listening to Clubhouse, uh, Robert Greene, brilliant writer, did the 48 Laws of Power. Mm-hmm. And somebody had told him early in his career, it's like, you really suck. Your writing really sucks. And it hurt for a while, but he, he used it to get better and work a little harder and that's the key. That's why Robert Greene is successful, because he did that. And if if you do let the criticism take you down, you're just it's just it's just a mistake, you know. So when people, you know, it's funny. I'm really fascinated when people talk about the term like being negative, because I, re- I remember I was on set once and we were doing a hidden camera, sh- hidden camera show and working with these these women that weren't, you know, it just, they were really green. They were having some problems. And I said, okay, that was cool. Let's do it one more time. Or let's do another take of this thing or do another bit. And, but it was basically like, we got to do that again. I think it was an intro to a bit and they had, we had to redo it. So they were like, why are you being so negative? <laughs> and I'm like, mm. well, it's a second take. We got, you know, we're going to have to do more <laughs> than one take, Ed Wood, you know? And right. so it was, uh, it was it was true. They were like thinking of that as negativity to say, let's do it again. But and I think that that's that happens with people where they're where they're they're thinking that somebody saying a, a criticism is negative. Well, it may be a positive if you turn it into that. So don't sure. be so certain what is negative and what's positive. It's a weird even the word toxic is like, what does it mean? Like, is it toxic to you? Is it, to- are you making it toxic? Mm-hmm. Water is toxic. Have you drank enough of it? Like, what does that mean? Right. Absolutely. So just be, uh, that's, that's what I was talking about early on. It's like, be cognizant of, of expressions that may 
actually slow you down or turn you into a victim when you're not. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, victim mentality is a major problem. You touched on something that I really kind of piqued my interest. What kind of hit you in the face when you got into show business that you just weren't expecting? You were like, oh, this is how it is. Like, I guess it's one of those life lessons that um, you don't realize reality is this way. And then you learn it is. And you're just like, dang, okay. Hmm. Well, there's a couple of big lessons I learned. One was don't be so quick to turn down jobs that you don't think you're right for or that you or, or you're feeling a little anxiety about. Like I, I would I, I would probably say yes to more things if I if I had to do it over again. Um, I'm not saying that I don't love my life and, you know, Morafate and all that stuff. But if I were listening to this podcast, I took something away from it. I would hope that the idea of like, you know, try to do more things, try not to try not to say no as much to potential exciting opportunities and, and adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I was always a hard worker. That was never an issue for me. And I was pretty social, but that, and, but I would, I mean, I would say that that is okay. Well, I would say that what really hit me is, is it's like the uh, pot experiment that not the weed, but like actually making pots there. They did an experiment where they had people work for like a full week on one pot. And then one group worked a full week on a, on one pot and they had another group work, work on like 20 pots for a full week. Right. Mm. So, and they wanted to see who would make the best pot. So now if you spent all week on one pot, it's going to be a, a great pot. Right. And if mm. you spend uh, a week working on 20 pots, well, maybe they'll all be kind of mediocre and maybe some will be better than others, but they can't be as good as that one pot that you worked a week on. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. If you just pump stuff out, if you just make a lot of pots, they found that the award-winning pot, the best pots, were coming from the group that made 20 pots. Mm. So it's just do it. Just make it. You know, I mean, I've written 20, not actually 19 screenplays, and I'm glad I did. I, I really think the first seven or eight were so bad. Mm. And so just just making it, just pumping it out. You know, I, I have a friend who's a successful songwriter and there's a, t- a long time where he was, I don't know if he does it anymore, long time where he's writing one song a day, like 365 songs a year. I mean, that's a lot yeah. of songs. And, <laughs> yes. you know, I mean, complete songs. It wasn't just like little morsels. And so I would say that the, just go, just do it, do it again, do it again. The best writers are the people who write a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and and you get your iPhone and make a film and then do it again and learn as much as you can, the software. I think that, I you know, when I was young, the barrier to entry was costly equipment. Now I think mm-hmm. the barrier to entry is learning software. Right. Absolutely. I think if you could if you could learn how to use your iPhone as as well as it, you can and or your whatever phone you have uh, and learn Premiere Pro or, or, or whatever editing software you use you know, you could, you can make something pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing what we have in our pocket compared to what they had yeah. 20 years ago in the studio. I it's know crazy. exactly. It's, um, there's no reason, but you know, it's like the old saying, you know, it's like, well, we, we, we didn't get a glut of great writers after the typewriter was invented. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily <laughs> that technology that's going to yeah, make people more sure. talented, absolutely. but it should, I mean, it, it, it seems like it should. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that's, uh, yeah. Now kind of going back to the idea of, you know, being successful, what particular habit have you practiced that has helped you to become as successful as you are? I would say probably consistency Mm -hmm. and writing, you know, like, Almost everything I do involves some writing Mm -hmm. and just continuing to write and come up with new material and new bits and just doing it as much as you can. Um, I I, I really think that the habit of writing is powerful, the habit of learning, the habit of trying to improve 
I think that's, I think the growth mindset, just the hat, just churning knowledge into a habit. And I mean, I have the, on my to-do list, it's like, okay, learn this program, learn that program. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm reading, st- I mean, the books on my desk, I'm, are, are philosophy books. Like I was a philosophy major and I'm still reading, rereading or reading nausea or, or Camus or, uh, what, what do I got over here? Oh, Aristotle and Nicomachean ethics. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's tough. I, I think that's actually a good habit is to read a little bit above your weight class. Like it's like, and, and I think it's easier now than ever because you could read and then if you're confused, go on the internet and have, you know, go to YouTube and there's people explaining what Nicomachean ethics are. So you could basically watch like 20 videos about the book and then read the book or, or concurrently as you're like get, saying, oh, this is, this is confusing, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that's sorry I was looking at the book but that that that's what helps so you know the fact that I wrote a book is just kind of like yeah I I like putting out stuff you know mm-hmm. and so but I still think even if I hadn't written a book I would still be writing and reading and just try to feed my brain because you never know where you're gonna get an idea and if you're just watching the same old crap and I, honestly I see stuff on TV sometimes that I'm like wow, these people have just been regurgitating the same ideas. Like nobody is read, nobody is doing something so odd or different that in their life or reading something that's odd and different that they don't, that, that, that they're kind of just, like some of the Marvel stuff is like cool, but it's also just, it's just more, it's just, it's just a loop of just, I watched the same, I, re- I read the same thing everybody else read and I'm watching the same thing everybody else is watching and now it's just a loop. So the, yeah. the artists I think who are doing the best are the ones who are just reading stuff that's a little bit off the beaten path. And sometimes more classical and the only reason you do that is because it stood the test of time. I mean Aristotle is, is no schmuck, you know, and, and, and mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely if you read about like what people, great people have read in their lives, it's like things like that, Nicomachean ethics. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, reading, exposing yourself to new ideas is, yeah. is so key. Um, to God, just, it, and it's, it doesn't, mind. it doesn't happen much. I mean, do you, when you talk to your friends, do you, do you, do you hear the same ideas over and over or do you hear new ideas? Um, <laughs> I would say, um, more same over and over, but, you know, hopefully, Hopefully we're engaging in some some conversations of new ideas. I haven't really thought about that. I have to I have to now be cognizant of that as I'm talking to my friends. I think you should, and I think you should try to be the guy who might look at something a little different. Because yeah. I because I because I do hear the same thing over and over, and it's 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 just so boring that I don't I don't feel like I could get uh I could get any traction or help from those conversations you know like in terms of making good stuff right yeah and and speaking of which um besides like reading what actual practices do you engage in that are conducive to creativity and also coming up with these um just new ideas oh Um, okay i got one um this is gonna be crazy i do this every single day um, I take, I do chess puzzles. So like two years ago, I learned chess. Like I, like, honestly, it was, and it was before Queen's Gambit, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I, 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 just, <laughs> right. I, I learned chess and, uh, I started playing, but, but also I started doing these chess puzzles on chess.com and I do it. I, it's funny cause I, I, my old boss was really a sharp guy and he would do crossword puzzles. So I never really got into that, but chess puzzles kind of sharpen your brain. So do the stuff that sharpens your brain, like practice piano or practice or, 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 you know, do some kind of like mind. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do meditation and I'd have, and I, I might get back into it, but honestly, lately the practice has been get up, go for a long walk or run and, uh, do some chess puzzles and try to read 10 pages of a book. That's sort of challenging. And that's been kind of my, and I skip, now I skip breakfast. I, uh, I just have coffee. So it's just coffee in the morning and all this other daily practice stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, those are good tips. I'm, now I have to go buy a piano. 
Uh, so you have to go buy a piano. Uh, I'm yeah. not, it's not a, Hey, listen, the funny thing is, is that piano, I just took up a few years ago, really. Mm -hmm. And chess a few years ago. So it's like, I think the key is that don't just rely on the stuff you've done as a kid, like mm -hmm. whatever age you are, try to come up with some kind of low technology system or device or practice. And, 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 and when I say low technology, for some reason, because you're dealing with technology all day, uh, just picking up a physical book or playing a piano or playing chess, and chess is on on an app, but but I mean saying like sort of go for these kind of low technology uh, items, and mm -hmm. for some reason it just it work it can work. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I said to myself early in the year was, um, you need to go more analog this year. <laughs> That's You're a better way to, that's a really better way to describe it. Go more analog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a good way to describe it. Cause I, I actually bought, a, 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 a an hourglass. And oh, wow. So that's another <laughs> nice. fucking way analog type of thing. So yeah, if I look around my office, it's like, I've got tons of digital dish, but also like it's, there nothing beats a notepad and, Right notes. I mean, I'm using Evernote like crazy, but I also, for some reason, it doesn't make sense really. Like I have a notepad and I have Evernote. So, but there's just times when I want to write something down. And I think that's the other thing that I would advise people to check out is like, keep on, allow yourself different modalities of, for creativity. Like I, like I'll type stuff out. I'll write stuff out. I have a big board of post-it notes giant post-it note in my office that I write, I'll write stuff, you know? And so it's like, you just, sometimes you get stuck if you're just sitting at a laptop for too many hours, get, you know, go out and then now write in a notebook and now write on your wall or write on three by five cards in a coffee shop. Like just, if you find yourself stuck, just use a different modality of the same basic thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, uh, that's great advice. Now, I want to make sure we talk about your book before we go any further, because I love it. I just am enthralled with all your stories. And yeah, like, I guess, uh, first off, how did you get the idea to write the book? Um, it's actually kind of dark. I was thinking to myself, I have these kids and eventually I'm going to die. And the, you know, will my ideas stick with them? And when they're older, will they like say, I wonder what dad meant by this or something, you know what I mean? So like, I thought as a dad, I should write things down and kind of gift it to my kids. And I don't know if that's arrogant or the kids care, but you know, I thought, if my dad had written a book, I would, I would probably revisit it, uh, you know, occasionally just for some reason, just to, to like, ah, here I am at 15 reading a book. And then, you know, cause you, you, if you read a book at 15 and, and the same book at 25, it's a different book. Like you mm -hmm. just, you, you're reading it differently. And so I kind of like the idea of like this permanent thing that my kids could deal with. But then that became uh, one of the key factors to write it death <laughs> but then the other which i think i mentioned the book actually but then the other factor was i just thought that fathers and mothers i suppose I, i've never been a mother so I, i'm just speaking for as a father that when they have this opportunity to impart some kind any kind of wisdom that they may have and everybody's got some wisdom about something they give it up to curious george you know like instead of talking to their kids about interesting situations they end up just reading about a monkey who goes crazy in new york city and a flamenco dancer who captures him and kidnaps him. it just it just doesn't seem like i need to tell my kids that story and it's amusing but i think i could do better mm -hmm. and so i i really got into telling them about my life and the kids were, at the time were really into it and i think when i think anybody who has kids will realize there there's a there's a pretty big window where they're fascinated by what dad was like before dad or mom was like before mom. And, and, and to this day, it's like, I don't tell them bedtime stories, but I do like to engage them in thought experiments. Yeah. So 
one of the cool things that I thought about your book as you asked your kids a lot of questions, mm-hmm. one of the cool things I, that I saw was you talked a lot about some of the setbacks that you dealt with, right? And, um, you know, obviously you're, you know, you've, you're a seasoned veteran in the film industry, but mm-hmm. what would you say to someone who's young, who's dealing with setbacks that you wish you had known back then? Um, because, you know, a setback can really crush a, a young person so much more than someone who's been through it all and realizes it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, I've been through a lot of those and I think, uh, it's a re- it's just a, it's, it's so, so important to build some sort of resilience and, and mm-hmm. grit. It's funny. I just read the Angela Duckworth book, grit. Oh yeah. And it's, boy, she has it right. Like you just have to build that and you have to have it. Um, one thing I, I noticed, I, I don't want to name any names, but I did work with somebody who was, had very little talent and a lot of confidence mm-hmm. and he did fine. He did well. And at the time I did, I, I was like, this is crazy. This guy sucks. And he, you know, and, it, and I, for some reason I was obsessing over it for a while. And then now I kind of look at that and think that's pretty common. And those of us who are feeling insecure about our talents, uh, just know that, you know, you could get there and you could improve your talents. And, you know, I think God given talents, I I just don't think it's as important as the hard work that makes you more talented and the the practice, right. And the Mm -hmm. concentrated practice, but just be aware. There's a lot of people out there who are going to do fine because they have that confidence and that confidence begets a lot of work, a lot, not giving up, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. those you know, and I'm a bit competitive. So like knowing that those people will beat me because instead of, you know, me questioning my talents all day uh, is going to lose to them confidently just moving forward, mm-hmm. even though I may actually, you know, be better. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. And so, so that's, that's a lot of Hollywood. And, and the weird paradigm is that the people who don't have much talent, but still put the work in, develop the talent. So right. don't, I, I wouldn't feel bad or feel like you need to give up. I mean, obviously, you know, somebody, some people just need to give up, but, <laughs> but sure. you know, before you do just consider that maybe, maybe your perception of your talents is skewed. And if you really do feel like you don't have the skills, we'll get them. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, uh, you know, you're referencing again, you know, growth mentality and yeah, um, yeah. Right. So what would you tell someone who's like, but I don't have the confidence, like, so how yeah, do I get, yeah. get the confidence that I don't have right. when I don't oh, well, have it? Okay. Uh, that's easy. Cause I'm not a very confident person either. So I, I think about this a lot. I guess I shouldn't say that, but I, 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 I've struggled with confidence issues. Do something well. Just do, just find something and do it well. And every time, <clears throat> every time you have a bit of success, if you learn a piano, you know, I learned a song on the piano, and I was like, oh, holy shit, I didn't know how to play piano, and now I learned a song, and it's actually kind of sounds okay. That builds confidence. So just doing shit makes you confident. Doing stuff. And then doing it well, you know, even if it takes, it doesn't matter if it takes you weeks and weeks or months to learn this song and you do it, it's an accomplishment and that will build you, that will give you confidence. Um, The other day, uh, just yesterday, I was feeling a little self-doubt about there's a project I had to do. And, uh, you know, I was saying, uh, you know, it's just, it's tough because these things, these episodes of the show and the new podcast I'm about to do, it takes me so long to go through the footage. And then I said, okay, so maybe I suck at that. And I could off, off, you know, offshore it or, or send it out to somebody else. But then I thought, well, what would, be, what would be a good amount of time? Like, if could I do this in three hours? If I did this in three hours, would I now consider myself pretty good at it? And then I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I want. I want to do that. And then I just worked really hard and focused like crazy and just put away all the distractions and just said, I'm going to finish this in three hours. And I did. I did. It was crazy. 
I just focused and did it. And that gave me a little more confidence. So it doesn't matter how, how all it's, listen, I just learned how to make really good poached eggs. I have a little bit more confidence now because of making a poached egg. It's not that hard, but I screwed it up a hundred times. And then finally I'm like, I make a pretty good poached egg. And I read a lot, like I watched a lot of YouTube videos and, 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 and watched the master class. And it was just whatever it takes to have a little bit of success. Success begets more success. So any, any way you could do that, just do it and get, make yourself, make yourself confident. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So fail your way to success, right? I mean, just keep kind of, yeah. yeah. Fail your way to success, right? Absolutely. Now, as far as, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to have to bring something up that I heard on a different podcast, but you, uh, part of, I think anyone who's successful, part of the reason why they're successful is some of the people that they meet, you know, obviously sure. it's, it's mostly you, it's partially, you know, the people that you work with. And I heard the story about you uh, meeting, uh, eventually meeting James L. Brooks. Yeah. Um, but y'all were pen pals for a while yeah. before you actually met him in person. So my question is, I know that he probably saw something in you. But beyond that, why do you think that, you know, the, the creator of The Simpsons continued to message you back and forth when he had so many things to do, so many things to work on? And just I, like literally that that story sounded fake, except I know that you're an honest person <laughs> and I know that, you know, you wouldn't lie. But like, well, OK, yeah, I, well, I OK, I could see why the story might sound fake. But OK, let me let me just make sure that there's one factor that you understand. So, I yes, I became pen pals with James L. Brooks. Um, but. What happened was it was a brand new medium. Like like nowadays you can't become email buddies with somebody because people are in a day with email. Mm -hmm. um, and if you went on a, a, some sort of chat, it's unlikely you're going to, you know, find a pen pal or find somebody to talk to that, you know. But this is brand new. Like basically I was on CompuServe, which is so old that, you know, I think it's from the 80s, that no most people have no idea what that is. And so it was like an it was like this internet chat system where you could just send a message to somebody, and nobody was no I mean very few people were on it, and and so I was like literally just looking for anybody who had a name I recognized on it, and so I was like on it and looking around and talking to random people, and then uh, and then I did searches for tons of just tons of searches found James L. Brooks. He was on it. And I was like, I emailed him and said, said you know, I made a made sure it was a funny, interesting observation. Like I wasn't, I was doing something that he, he would probably find funny or interesting. Like I wasn't boring. And I, I worked at that, you know, I didn't, I knew what would be boring. And so he just was like, Oh, there's somebody on the, in cyberspace, this weird new frontier that I could chat with. that could be good. Cause he's a regular person. And in San Diego. And so we started talking back and forth, but it was really because the medium was so new and it was such a crazy thing to talk to somebody through the internet that that's kind of what started. And then we talked for a while. And then finally he said, you know, why don't you just come up and we'll have a meeting. It's like two hours away. So I came up and pitched them badly, pitched them like a bunch of movie ideas that would never make any sense. And, uh, and then I, and then he said, what about you? What, what is your, what do you do in your life? And I said, well, I'm, the, I, I'm doing, making movies for Costco or, you know, I'm, I'm a price club. I'm, I'm doing, I, I made this thing called terror in the tire center and let them eat pizza and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, days of forklifts. And like, just, he was laughing, like just at the titles of these stupid educational movies that I was like making like into these little cinema masterpieces, you know, shooting on film and, you know, just putting special effects in them. And so he goes, that's your movie. Why don't you make it? Why don't you stop with this other stuff and make a movie, write a movie about that? And so I ran home to L.A. I didn't run. I drove mm. and <laughs> went to uh, started writing this thing called Die Wholesale. And it was it was like dog day afternoon at a Costco. And uh, we I, it, he it wasn't for him. Like after I wrote it, it was like. It was a little, a little bit of a breakfast club vibe, but it wasn't really like 
terms of endearment at all, you know? And so I started getting it out there, got an agent, got a, um, got actually got funding for it. Funding fell through because in Hollywood, like stuff goes wrong and, uh, an actor like sued the movie over some crazy reason. And it was just, a, it was, it didn't work out. And then I, but I just quickly pivoted to my next movie, which was poor white trash. So the failure of that first movie, I had to go through like, asked and stuff to kind of deal with it but um which is which is another interesting story because um I, what the one thing i got which i could tell, save you guys a lot of time but if you ever have a big failure like that one way to look at it is if you're going to be a filmmaker or you're going to make tv or any endeavor you do if you have a big like let's say you're gonna be an entrepreneur and your business fails well an entrepreneur isn't defined as one business an entrepreneur is probably has lots of businesses over the course of his lifetime. And so if I was going to be a filmmaker and I, I didn't get one movie made, well, that's not a filmmaker. I have 50 movies to make in my lifetime. And if I fail at the first one, I just go to the next one. Like you have to start looking at that scale. You have to start going, it's not about one failure. It's, it's, it's about, I, here's my, ovule. here's my body of work and just go to the next one. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that's great advice because you know you can you know really take, like you said earlier, take that L to heart and uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully not let it crush you. Yeah. Uh, um, in that uh, same um, conversation of, it sounds like you just have tons of advice for young artists, which is uh, phenomenal because young artists need advice. What other important advice that you haven't touched on would you uh, tell someone? who's just getting started to help them to really, you know, become successful. Um, I don't think it's best. I think it's good to understand the market, but it's also good to go against it in some ways, you know, like don't do what's expected you know, necessarily like try to do something that's real, like a fresh, th it's kind of like if you're at a party and you're saying the same joke or the same, or, or you're just kind of echoing what everybody else is saying, you're not going to be very, spe a very special person at that party. Like you're not like if, if your if your inclusion into the, into the dialogue is the same basic ish, I don't think you're going to get m attention. I think mm -hmm. you have to kind of be, um, follow a different muse. And I'm not saying do, you know, purposely be different, but, um, just, th just imagine like the stuff that excites you is probably a little different, you know? I mean, it's <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I still think that like you, you could get attention from the thing that's not, what everybody else is doing. I was just watching uh, an early uh, Richard Linklater movie and it was just so unique. It was so like this, the format of this movie is different. The contents of this movie are different. Like it's just, it's a uniquely him. And I think he consciously is saying, Hey, look, this is what I want to bring to the table. And I know not everybody's doing it. And so therefore it's worthy of watching. So I would say that I would say, you know, if, if your ideas are a little crazy, that's, that's okay. That's, that's, that's probably more fun to watch than if your ideas are the same as everybody else's. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking outside the box and, you know, reimagining, uh, you know, cause someone has to be the first, right? Well, yeah. Like you, yeah. You, if you want to be Quentin Tarantino, don't do what Quentin Tarantino does. Right. Absolutely. Be your version of Quentin Tarantino. Do, you do something that's you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. The original. Um, what is it? That sounds to some degree like a life hack, which is a, a question I like to ask uh, for my audience and also for myself. So what's a life hack that you've discovered that you feel like most people don't know, but you feel like they should? Well, I think a regular, I, I mentioned a regular habit of writing, but I also think that like, just run with it. If you, if you come up with some crazy, crazy idea or crazy thought, 
like just run with it for a little bit, you know, and just stretch those muscles, you know, and for some reason, I feel like it's it, these are seeds that you're planting and and uh, the more seeds you plant in your head and the more you get you start to plant and then prune those plants, the more you have a better a better garden. And so I just think cultivating that, you know, just like those are the, you know, if you're if you're working on something like I, I like I try to have the opposite or a contrarian view on things just to see if that works too. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm just Absolutely. saying like, you know, try to cultivate things that are a little bit that haven't been said, hopefully, yeah. or maybe they have, but you, you're trying to come up with your take on it. Sure. No, I'm with you on that. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I know it's a dangerous time and to open your mouth, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I do think that the people who are saying, are, are trying to say new things that are genuinely new or genuinely a different take are, are, are really helpful to make the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, the beauty of, um, art is we, you know, you with your films and I wouldn't call my podcast art, but you know, sure we all is. have, we have, uh, we all have a, a, a voice to share and we should, uh, definitely be mindful of, you know, what we put out in the world, right? So, well, but uh, yeah, it, we all have a voice to share, but sometimes we might consider listening and not talking, you know? Yeah. No. And, 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 oh, and then, and to, in order to cultivate a better voice. Sure. Absolutely. No, I'm with you on that. Um, very cool. Well, um, we're, uh, to some degree, um, I mean, we are, uh, running short on time as far as time goes. I, you know, I, I love everything that you put out in the world as far as, you know, your, your mission of, you know, like you said in your book, uh, just making less a-holes in the world <laughs> yeah. and okay. helping those, huh? Yeah. Hopefully I, I can yeah. help that. <laughs> yeah. And helping them to maybe become self-aware if they do. Is there any final thoughts that you have for just uh, young people, people yeah. in general. Yeah, yeah actually, I, there, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, I know I know what I want to leave with. It's funny that in this conversation, being an asshole has come up a few times, right? Mm. And and so what is an asshole? You know, I mean, it's pretty obvious if somebody's beating children, they're an asshole. Like, a, you know, or, or, or killing innocent black people. We know that's an asshole. But I think we're developing now a new kind of asshole or, or revisiting. It's actually an old kind of asshole. And that's the victim asshole, you know? And mm -hmm. I see it and I, I've even seen it in a bit in my family and I try to nip that in the bud, which is the idea that you're going to say something Yiddish and then somebody else says something Yiddish to you and then you want to pull the victim card or you want to play victim when actually you were just as much a part of the shit conversation or thing right sure and so you know nietzsche talks a lot about uh, he calls it slave morality but it's not like slave like american slavery it's just mm -hmm. it's obviously historically been the case but uh that there's been slaves so um but that master slave like the idea of are you gaining anything by 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 just cultivating victimhood and there are obviously real victims, but just I think I would hope that people always check themselves. And I have friends who do that with me. It's like if I say, "Oh, what was me?" It's like they're like, "Ah, eh, you being a victim." Like, are you mm -hmm. are you saying like, "Oh, society is being mean to me"? Like when you're starting out in the business, it's easy to say, "Oh, it's easy for Mike Gaddis. He's a white guy, or whatever, whatever, whatever you think is made life easy for me." That's your that's your narrative. That's your story, and the story works for you, but it also keeps you a victim. So, right. I w I would hope that people, if they're listening to this, explore how damaging it is and how much you're kind of being an asshole by 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 because when you play the victim, I mean Hitler was playing a victim. Like those yes. Polish people invaded and, and, and we got to take our land back because they're mean to the Germans. I mean, really, that was his thing is people are mean to the Germans and we got to fight back. So that's that's a kind of asshole. The whole 
playing victim in order to be either an aggressor or an asshole. Yes, absolutely. And the thing about when you play a victim is you don't ever improve yourself because, no. you know, mm-hmm. this is do- being done to me and it's not fair. And, you know, you're not going to become a better version of yourself by looking at the world and pointing fingers and, uh, you know, throwing yourself a pity party and stuff. Exactly. And I, and I, I don't I, I don't mean to be insensitive to people who have gone through hardships, but the, I'm just saying the people who are successful, it's not because who they knew and, you know, how lucky they got. Luck is helpful. But it's also they don't they don't see themselves as being a loser or victim. And anytime you do, and I do, I do that. It's 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 easy to fall into that trap. You got to just stop yourself and say, mm-hmm. you know, put on the big boy panties and let's go. Yes, absolutely. No, that's a that's a good uh, good good point to end on. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Although yeah. uh, I've never, you know. Big boy panties. Uh, you never heard that. Like, that's I didn't make that up. That's an old one. It's <laughs> no, like I'm, it's like an army insult type of thing. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, private, put on your big boy panties and get to work. It's oh like, goodness gracious. Yeah, <laughs> that's a new one. Yeah, uh, it's old. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. Well, Mike, uh, this has been yeah. a great conversation. Uh, yes. Before we wrap up, I like to actually do a little thing called freestyle rapping. Um, so I, uh, I can't rap at all yeah yeah you don't have to you just oh have good to and so uh, i rapped when i was in a funk band so many years ago but it's mm-hmm. embarrassing to listen to and i don't want to do it again <laughs> yeah, you know i mean sometimes you need to humble yourself with some embar- No, i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah okay oh you mean you're gonna rap then yeah i'm gonna rap i'm perfect gonna rap. okay so, that, yeah. that's awesome i'd like to hear that yes absolutely so hang on one sec all right here we go all right, here we go. Roll up like a savage. It's Michael Addis, that one dude that just comes through and practical jokers pulling a bunch of pranks. And that's what he does. He's laughing to the bank. He's doing a bunch of things. Check the things that he brings. A whole bunch of things in the street. That's what I say. He makes it complete. He helps you understand you can't even quit. You got to use grit when you go and flip a whole bunch of pots and do it nonstop. Make freaking 20 so you can make plenty that are much better. And that's what I say. Create a treasure and you got to do well. That's what I'm saying. You just got to spell your own name up in the sky with that confidence. Use common sense. I'm talking about notes. Help us to fix the things that we got. Or will they just make the plot much thicken? Yo, I'm just flipping rhymes all the time. And yo, I just come with a dope rhyme. Talking about goals. Don't be an a-hole. That is the one that you not just need to follow. And that's what I'm saying. You got to just come through and just stop playing the victim card. That's not the way to go. And that's what I say up in the radio. I'm spitting freestyles. And don't freaking forget it. You need a work ethic. You just got to keep doing a bunch of things. Forget about sleep. Basically what I'm saying is you just got to keep on growing with the mentality. And that's what I say. Don't see yourself as a casualty. Instead, you got to understand how you got to be sharpened in a new conversation creating. That's what I'm saying. Spit a freestyle. We are just talking about a bunch of things to just be crazy with the ideas and just run with them. And that's what I say. Sometimes you got to listen instead of being a critic. You just need to quit it. You need to understand a whole bunch of things that you get. Maybe some feedback. Maybe you need that to make yourself better. And that's what I say. Up in LA weather, crazy hot. Maybe on the spot, and that's what I'm saying. You know the plot to just be the creator that you are, and that's what I say. You are just a star. You got to step into it and just never quit, and that's what I say with these words that I rip. I spit off the top, and that's how I go, and that's what I said with a freestyle flow. <laughs> yeah. That's All nice. Right. How, many, how many times have you done that? I mean, like not that one, but how many times have you freestyled uh, at, at, a, at a, on a podcast? Oh, I do it. I I used to only do it with my interviews, and uh-huh. then recently I started uh, throwing it in at the end of my uh, solo episodes too. So, yeah. Wow. See, I, I bet you're getting better each time, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You gotta, you know, you just gotta keep practicing. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know. I mean. 
you know, sometimes uh, you 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 spit bars that are fire, and sometimes you know you just you know you you just try to do well with uh, the eggs that I'm cracking to make this omelet. <laughs> <laughs> you have to crack those eggs. Yes, to make the omelet. Oh my God. Uh, well, I'll have to send you a link to the 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 rap that I did a long time ago. <laughs> yes, oh, I want to see. It, I was in a band called the Playground Slap, and we did we did a rap. Very cool. Well, Mike, it's been a great conversation. I I Thank really you, do appreciate. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I appreciate you just coming and taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, be on the podcast and just uh, you know spread some positive energy in the world. Uh, real quick, how can people find you online? At Mike Addis. At Mike Addis. A D D I S. Yeah. At Mike right. Addis, and that's uh, that's I'm uh, my website is michaeladdis.com, but my Instagram is at Mike Addis. Yes, absolutely, Just and of course, confuse people. No, it's fine. Um, of course, I got to check out your book. Yep, and... Who's Your Daddy? Bedtime stories I tell my kids, but maybe shouldn't. Absolutely, and uh, highly recommend that. And also, I am going to tag Heckler in <laughs> the show notes because good I. I needed to watch that video or I need to watch that movie that was uh, made for me. And I think every other creator in the world. So. <laughs> good, good. I hope people enjoy it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the time, Mike. I appreciate you much. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. And I hope you take some of those ideas and practices and implement them in your own lives. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit follow so that you don't miss future episodes. And also, if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, that would be greatly appreciated. And I'll leave instructions on how to do that in the show notes. Okay, so that's all I got for now. Take care of yourself. And until next time, peace. Yeah,